Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello, I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and through it we seek to be drawn closer to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to the Father through the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We most certainly thank you that you are God. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. Heavenly Father, now that we have gathered around your word, we pray that it might be a word that truly uh, transforms our lives. Your word is a living word, and we thank you that it is able to touch us exactly where each and every one of us individually and corporately need to be touched so that we might be your people in the world today. And so we ask you to bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday we read how King Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of the kings of Israel before him. The evil he did included building a temple for Baal in Samaria and then setting up an altar for Baal in that temple that he had built. He also erected an Asherah pole. All of these things aroused the anger of the Lord. So it was the Lord through the prophet Elijah who told Ahab that there would be no rain on the land until Elijah said there would be no rain. In order to protect Elijah, God sent him eastward across the Jordan River. There he would hide in the Kareth ravine and drink from that particular brook that was there. God also directed the ravens to supply Elijah with bread and meat each morning and each evening. After the brook dried up, the Lord directed Elijah to go to Sidon to a widow there. In an amazing miracle of provision, the widow's flour jar never ran out and the jug of oil that she had never ran dry until the Lord brought rain again back on the land. Now while Elijah was staying with the widow, the widow's son became sick and died. Elijah took the boy up to his room and laid him out on his bed and cried out to the Lord, asking that the, Lord's, that the boy's life be restored. The Lord listened to Elijah, and the boy's life was returned to him, and Elijah gave him back to his mother. At the direction of the Lord then, Elijah presented himself to King Ahab and uh, directed Ahab to... Um, Call together all of the people of Israel as well as the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah to meet him at Mount Carmel. The question Elijah asked the people was this. How long would the people waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. A contest was suggested by Elijah. A contest which would prove without a shadow of a doubt who the true God is. A sacrifice would be prepared on two separate altars, but no fire would be added to them. No, the true God would need to answer by fire, sending fire to consume the sacrifice without human intervention, adding fire to the altar and to the sacrifice. The prophets of Baal were given the opportunity to go first. While they cried out to Baal, while they danced, while they cut themselves throughout the day and received no answer, Elijah was repairing the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. It was no surprise to Elijah that Baal didn't answer these prophets. He couldn't. He simply isn't a god. At the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah directed the people to come to the altar he had repaired. And there, at the altar he had prepared, he prepared a sacrifice. And there he asked that they do an unusual thing. That unusual thing was this. 
he directed the people to pour water on the sacrifice which lay on the Lord's altar, not once, but three times. Now, we all know how well wet wood burns. It doesn't. It may smolder a bit, but it most certainly doesn't burn. Surely, at this point, the people's interest was piqued. Then the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Now let's notice that Elijah did not have to cry, scream, dance, cut himself, repeat himself over and over again. All he did was let the people know that what he had done and what he was doing was done at the command of the Lord, and he was just simply following the command he was given. After he had let the people know that he had been and was even then following the command of the Lord, he simply said, Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. It was a simple prayer, but it got immediate and impressive results. Because then we read, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. At this point, with the people having recognized that the Lord is indeed God, Elijah had the prophets of Baal seized, taken to the Kishon Valley, and slaughtered there. Yesterday, I spoke about how, as the day of Jesus' return nears, we will need to grow in the ability to discern between the signs, wonders, and miracles of the Lord, and that the Lord will bring on the earth, and the signs, wonders, and miracles of the enemy. We simply have got to get in the habit of testing every spirit, every sign, every wonder, every miracle to see if these will be from God or not. The spirits who will be sent to us by God will in no way be offended when we ask them if they belong to Jesus and if he is their Lord. The spirits that do not belong to God hate to even hear the name of Jesus. They can't stand the name of Jesus. They hiss, they cower, they cry out in disgust. The signs, wonders, and miracles from the Lord will glorify him. And the people through whom the Lord will work will also glorify the Lord. These people will be people of true humility. They will not even desire any recognition for themselves. It's not that some of these people won't become known in every household, but they will not have sought the recognition. Let's continue to keep in our minds these words of Jesus, which are found in Matthew 24, beginning at verse 23. Jesus said, concerning the signs of the end of the age, he said, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or, here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. We also need to remember this. No one, and I repeat that, no one knows about that day or hour not the angels in heaven, and not Jesus. Only our Father in heaven knows when Jesus will return. Most assuredly, no one can predict the day Jesus will return. Please, let's not get fooled by those who say that we can know the day. No, we cannot. We are living right now in the end times, and so we are in the season of the end. And most certainly, we can and we should be watching for the signs God has given us to watch for so that we won't be surprised when that day arrives. But let's not be suckered in by those who say they know exactly when the end will come. The end didn't come on May 21st, as was predicted. 
It is not going to come on October 21st, nor will it come on December 21st, 2012. Let's live our lives focused on what our Lord has told us in his word. God does not lie. And so we can trust his word, all of his word, to be true. Now, after God's stunning display of power over Baal, and Baal's prophets, and their slaughter, Elijah then told Ahab to go, eat, and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Elijah himself went to the top of Carmel and prayed uh, for rain. Then, and when Elijah's servant could see a cloud rising from the sea, Elijah directed his servant to go and tell Ahab to hitch up his chariot and head to Jezreel before the heavy rain stopped him. This the servant did. But the power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. In other words, Elijah, on foot, outran Ahab's chariot. Now we come to 1 Kings 19, and here we have a record of a startling turn of events. Elijah has just shown God to be God in great strength. But Elijah will end up running for his life because Jezebel, King Ahab's wife, will make threats against him. It is so very important for us to remain on guard and alert to any counterpunches by the devil after we have won a spiritual victory. Because if we do not remain alert, if we let our guard down, then we will become an easy target for the devil's countermeasures. 1 Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Let me just say that I totally understand how it is that Elijah could run for his life after such a tremendous victory. After we have stood through a spiritual struggle, we can be physically beaten and exhausted. And the last thing on our mind is taking on another foe on another front. What Elijah failed to do, we must do. We must do two things so that we do not end up as Elijah did at this particular point. First, we must cry out to the Lord to protect us from the new attack. And second, we must keep the people who have already been praying for us, praying for us. God will eventually let us know when it's safe to rest, but we must remain vigilant until God gives the all-clear signal. Okay, let's read on. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around. And there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mount of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. 
After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Let's briefly stop here. Yes, Elijah had been exhausted when Jezebel made her threats against his life, and in his exhaustion, Elijah fled. But here at Mount Horeb, the place where God had met with Moses, the place where Israel had covenanted with God, God corrects Elijah's assumption. Elijah was not alone. God had reserved for himself 7,000 who had not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths had not kissed him. Elijah had wanted the Lord to retire him permanently by killing him. But the Lord had other plans for him. Elijah still had work to do for the Lord. His work including, included anointing Hazael, king over Aram, anointing Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anointing Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola to see, succeed him as prophet. It is interesting to note that Elijah makes no further complaint to the Lord, and immediately we hear the following. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Now this is our introduction to Elisha, Elijah's successor. The exchange between Elijah and Elisha is somewhat strange, yet... Elisha so completely chooses to go with Elijah that he slaughtered his oxen and burned the, the plowing equipment. Using the plowing equipment, he, burned to, he, he used that to cook the meat. By doing this, Elisha was dramatically signifying that he would not be returning to the family farm. He would, from that point on, be Elijah's assistant. Elijah mentoring him until the Lord himself would separate them, not through Elijah's death, but with a fiery chariot dispatched from heaven. 1 Kings chapter 20. Now this is an interesting chapter. What I find to be most interesting about it is the role of the prophet of God um, throughout this chapter. The prophet made King Ahab aware of the plans Ben-Hadad was making against Israel. The prophet told the king how the battle was to be engaged. The prophet told the king that he was to strengthen his position because Ben-Hadad would return in the spring to attack him again. And then when spring arrived, Ahab was assured of victory by the man of God. Unfortunately, Ahab would make a treaty with Ben-Hadad the man the Lord had determined to die. Ahab and Israel would become the recipients of the Lord's words which were supposed to have come against Ben-Hadad. Having now given everyone a, a kind of an overview on what to kind of listen for, and of course what the Lord will, you know, pique our interest on, uh, let's hear 1 Kings 20 again paying attention to the function of the prophet in this chapter. 
Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mustered his entire army, accompanied by 32 kings with their horses and chariots. He went up and besieged Samaria and attacked it. He sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, saying, This is what Ben-Hadad says. Your silver and gold are mine, and the best of your wives and children are mine. The king of Israel answered, Just as you say, my lord the king, I and all I have are yours. The messengers came again and said, This is what Ben-Hadad says. I sent to demand your silver and gold, your wives and your children. But about this time tomorrow, I'm going to send my officials to search your palace and the houses of your officials. They will seize everything you value and carry it away. The king of Israel summoned all the elders of the land and said to them, See how this man is looking for trouble? When he sent for my wives and my children, my silver, my gold, did I refuse him? The elders and the uh, people all answered, Well, don't listen to him or agree to his demands. So he replied to Ben-Hadad's messengers, Tell my lord the king, your servant will do all you demanded the first time, but this demand I cannot meet. They left and took the answer back to Ben-Hadad. Then Ben-Hadad sent another message to Ahab, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even dust remains in Samaria to give each of my men a handful. The king of Israel answered, Tell him, One who puts on his armor should not boast, like one who takes it off. Then Hadad heard this message while he and the kings were drinking in their tents, and he ordered his men, prepare to attack. So they prepared to attack the city. Meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and announced, This is what the Lord says, Do you see this vast army? I will give it into your hand today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. But who will do this, asked Ahab. The prophet replied, this is what the Lord says, the junior officers under the provincial commanders will do it. And who will start the battle, he asked. The prophet answered, you will. So Ahab summoned the 232 junior officers under the provincial commanders. Then he assembled the rest of the Israelites, 7,000 in all. They set out at noon while Ben-Hadad and his 32 kings allied with him were in their tents getting drunk. The junior officers under the provincial commanders went out first. Now Ben-Hadad had dispatched scouts who reported men are advancing from Samaria. He said if they come come out for peace, take them alive. If they have come out for war, take them alive. The junior officers under the provincial commanders marched out of the city with the army behind them, and each one struck down his opponent. At that, the Arameans fled with the Israelites in pursuit, but Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on horseback with some of his horsemen. The king of Israel advanced and overpowered the horses and chariots and inflicted heavy losses on the Arameans. Afterward, the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Strengthen your position and see what must be done, because next spring the king of Aram will attack you again. Meanwhile, the officers of the king of Aram advised him, Their gods are gods of the hills. That's why they were too strong for us. But if we fight them on the plains, surely we will be stronger than they. Do this, remove all the kings from their commands and replace them with other officers. You must also raise an army like the one you lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, so we can fight Israel on the plains. Then surely we will be stronger than they. He agreed with them and acted accordingly. The next spring, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. When the Israelites were also mustered and given provisions, they marched out to meet them. The Israelites camped opposite them like two small flocks of goats while the Arameans covered the countryside. The man of God uh, came up and told the king of Israel, This is what the Lord says. Because the Arameans think that the Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valleys, I will deliver this vast army into your hands and you will know that I am the Lord. 
For seven days they camped opposite each other, and on the seventh day the battle was joined. The Israelites inflicted a hundred thousand casualties on the Aramean foot soldiers in one day. The rest of them escaped to the city of Aphek, where the wall collapsed on 27,000 of them. And Ben-Hadad fled to the city and hid in an inner room. His officials said to him, Look, we have heard that the kings of Israel are merciful. Let us go to the king of Israel with sackcloth around our waists and ropes around our heads. Perhaps he will spare your life. Wearing sackcloth around their waists and ropes around their heads, they went to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. The king answered, Is he still alive? He is my brother. The men took this as a good sign and were quick to pick up his word. Yes, your brother Ben-Hadad, they said. Go get him, the king said. When Ben-Hadad came out, Ahab had him come up into his chariot. I will return the cities my father took from your father, Ben-Hadad offered. You may set up your own market areas in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. Ahab said, on the basis of a treaty, I will set you free. So he made a treaty with him and let him go. By the word of the Lord, one of the company of the prophets said to his companion, Strike me with your weapon, but he refused. So the prophet said, Because you have not obeyed the Lord, as soon as you leave me, a lion will kill you. And after the man went away, a lion found him and killed him. The prophet found another man and said, Strike me, please. So the man struck him and wounded him. And the prophet went and stood by the road waiting for the king. He disguised himself with a headband down over his eyes. As the king passed by, the prophet called out to him and said, Your servant went into the thick of battle, and someone came to me with a captive and said, Guard this man. If he is missing, it will be your life for his life, or you must pay a talent of silver. While your servant was busy, here and there the man disappeared. That is your sentence, the king of Israel said. You have pronounced it upon yourself. And that's where we are going to stop. And... Um, we just bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer, and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.